evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca Clark. I'm the Historical Director at Better Days, an educational nonprofit that highlights Utah women's history. And on behalf of our partners and our co-hosts, the U.S. Mint, the National Women's History Museum, and the Utah Historical Society, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Historic Change, celebrating the life and legacy of Sakala Shah. So thank you to the Salt Lake City Public Library for hosting us tonight, and thank you all for being here. Sakala Shah, or Gertrude Simmons Bonin, tirelessly advocated for Native American citizenship and voting rights in the early 20th century. We are here tonight to celebrate the official release of the U.S. Mint's new quarter, featuring Zakala Shah. More broadly, we are here to celebrate her inspiring legacy of leadership, advocacy, and courage. Before we begin the program, I would like to first thank BYU's Red Center for Western Studies for helping fund tonight's event. I'd also like to thank Peter Creer and Sons Violins for providing the violin stand for this beautiful display. And finally, thank you to the following community partner organizations who hosted the tables out there in the atrium with all the great activities before the event. The Utah Division of Indian Affairs, the BYU Native American Curriculum Initiative, the Salt Lake Public Library, the U.S. Mint, the National Women's History Museum, the Utah Historical Society, and Better Days. Now, it is my pleasure to turn over the next few minutes to Rosanna Benali Sag from the Utah Division of Indian Affairs. She will give our land acknowledgement and then introduce Miss Indian World, Cassie John. Cassie will be followed by Frederick Urban, President and CEO of the National Women's History Museum. Rosanna. Thank you, Rebecca. Yat e shik e do shedene e she e rosanna benali inishia ki ani nishle muri yuta dishavan. We are on the ancestral homelands in here in Utah of the Confederated Tribes of Goshute Reservation, Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah, San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe, Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation, Skull Valley Band of Goshute, Ute Indian Tribe of the Uinta and Oray. Ute Mountain Ute White Mesa Community, and Navajo Nation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rosanna Benali Sag, and I work for the Utah Division of Indian Affairs. I'm originally from Dinebikea, which are the ancestral homelands of the Navajo people. I come from a strong matrilineal line of Diné women, Shema, Shema Sane, Shana Asan, in my Diné traditions, we identify ourselves through what we call clanship. I am of the Towering House people. Through our mothers, we carry her clan from generation to generation. For as long as my ancestors have been here, we have always introduced ourselves through our clanship and recognize and acknowledge the land we stand on and visit. As I shared our tribal nations that I mentioned, I am originally from this land, and I am also a visitor to the lands of my native brothers and sisters, and to Mother Earth. We introduce ourselves in this way to acknowledge each other's stewardship of Mother Earth, and to show our connection through Kojon, or a good way. These acknowledgments, much like all aspects of our life way, were built on the spiritual foundation that connects us all. As these land acknowledgments have evolved, into a formalized statement or script. It is also a way to help educate others. I encourage all of you to read a book, article, or resource about one of our indigenous communities here in Utah or throughout our nation. Or as we are celebrating our indigenous women, learn about our indigenous women authors, such as Wilma Mankiller of the Cherokee Nation, Joy Harjo of the Muscogee Nation, or a local author here in Utah, Casey At City. Now as we enter a new season, take a moment to honor and give thanks to our Mother Earth for the mountains we venture on, the land we walk and drive on, the water we drink to nourish our way of life, and the air we use. I would like to honor the many women, especially of indigenous background, who have left or continue to leave a legacy 
of paving a path or opening doors of access to our generations now and for the future. We're thankful to have family members of Zikala Shah and thank you to the organizers of this important celebration. Now, I would like to introduce a remarkable individual who is an amazing leader in our community and across the nation, Cassie John. She is a descendant to generations of rug weavers and storytellers. She is empowered to share her story as a proud Diné Astana representing the Diné Nation and the communities of Rock Point and Chilchenbito, Arizona. Growing up surrounded by creativity from her grandmothers, mother, aunties, and older sisters, she paved, paved the way for Cassie to learn and channel their talents with rug weaving, beading, sewing, and powwow dancing. Seeing how the women in her life illuminate their strength, dedication, and commitment to preserving our traditions inspired Cassie to try uh, to carry on her love of our indigenous people and her Diné way of life. Cassie is a first generation college graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Multidisciplinary D Design from the University of Utah. Currently, she works for the state of Utah's Department of Health and Human Services as a tribal health equity leader. As an artist, Cassie aims to have our indigenous people see themselves in her artwork to encourage all to lead a creative life which reflects our thriving communities, our tribal languages, and our resiliency to be bold and innovative, providing a glimpse into our future together. Cassie John feels honored to represent indigenous peoples across the globe as a cultural goodwill ambassador, proudly holding the title of Miss Indian World 2024-2025. So give a big round of applause to Cassie John. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rosetta, for that beautiful introduction. As Miss Indian World, it's an honor to bring this title home here to the state of Utah. It's been many times coming, and I feel very honored. Uh, as Miss Indian World, I get to travel all over Indian country and I get to visit with so many relatives. And tonight I am so happy to be coming home back to my state, back to where I live here in Salt Lake City, to the work that I do as a tribal health equity leader and most importantly as an artist to honor the life and legacy of Zakala Shah. Um, over the weekend, I got to go to Milwaukee where I met with so many individuals, so many relatives um, through powwow dancing. And when we were talking about stories of Zakala Shah and her impact with the Lakota, the Sioux, and all of the powerful indigenous women in the Plains region of the United States, we all came to one consensus that she was ahead of her time. And she truly paved the way for all of our indigenous people to be proud of who we are. And personally, when I got to learn a little bit more of Zakala Shah, I learned about her artistry as an artist, as a composer, as an activist. And as an artist myself, one thing that her and I share that I'm very proud that we are honoring this incredible woman is that as artists, we tell stories. And as indigenous artists, we tell legacies. We share our love, we share our values. And it is an important role as an indigenous woman to tell those stories, to tell our impacts with our communities. And speaking our language is such a big component of that. And while we're talking about Sakala Shah, she took that role for her community. Uh, for the Sioux people, she translated important documents for her communities. And through that work, she began to see the importance of how vital it is to carry on our traditions as indigenous peoples. For, for many of us, uh, one of the unique things as Native American people and our indigenous relatives across the globe, the thing that makes us the unique, the thing that makes us powerful is our language, our connection to culture, our connection to spirituality. And one of the things when I was learning a little bit more of Sakala Shah is how powerful she was as a woman, expressing herself through the various avenues, through the music industry, uh, through herself as a, as a writer, illustrating how important it was to carry on 
important narratives. And one of the narratives that she shared was most importantly about her experiences as an indigenous woman. And I'm really happy here to share those teachings, share those values that she brought up in her writings, especially when she, her experiences going through the Indian boarding school system. And for many of my family, my parents especially, they went through that system. And as we're gathered here today, I want to encourage all of our visitors, all of our allies here, while you're listening to these stories about Zakala Shah and how she told her narrative, the challenges that she faced, that this history is not so far long ago. It is truly still impacting my generation today. And it is so important that we continue to tell these stories, to uplift and recognize these incredible women, because they truly were a testament of who we are as Indigenous women, that we are proud and that we are coming from a deep love and passion for our communities to uplift our people. And for many generations to come, I'm so happy that we get to come here honoring Zakala Shah and also tell her story for future generations to come and that we have a whole new generation that is going to know her name and that is going to recognize her story. So I want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart as Miss India Royal Cassie John. This is one of the privileges that I get to have in my reign is meeting these incredible people and to recognize and pass along my pride as an indigenous woman, and most especially sharing my story as a Dine Hassana and Navajo woman. So thank you so much, and I hope we learn more this evening, carry on these stories, and take time after this event to digest, to carry on, and to empower those that we see that need the spiritual uplifting. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie, that was beautiful. Welcome everyone. My name is Frederick Irwin. I'm the President and CEO of the National Women's History Museum. We are so proud to co-host this event alongside our incredible partners, the United States Mint, the Utah Historical Society, and Better Days. We're really honored to be here tonight and honored to be consultants to the U.S. Mint on the American Women Quarters Program. Women's history is history, but so often women's stories, their voices, their contributions are underrepresented, if not omitted entirely. In places of knowledge and power, places like public sculpture and museums to classroom textbooks, and yes, even our currency, women's stories are omitted. And there's a consequence to that. According to the World Economic Forum, we are still 95 years away from reaching gender equality in the United States. And we really can't afford to wait that long. We envision a world at the National Women's History Museum where women's impacts and contributions, both past and present, are available and accessible to girls and boys, and that this access will ignite tangible action for gender equality and empowerment. It starts with sharing their stories. We want our children, girls and boys, to know the powerful history of women in this country. And for tomorrow's change makers to not only know, but imagine what's possible. It is this very urgent pursuit of representation and inclusion that brings us here tonight to celebrate the life and legacy of Zikala Shah, a champion of indigenous rights and citizenship, a pioneer for women's equality and education, a writer, teacher, composer, and musician. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you to our partners, to Treasure Malerba, to the family of Zikalasa, and to tonight's program participants. May Zikalasa Shah's life and legacy inspire us all to take meaningful action and to create the world we want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna and Cassie and Frederick for your remarks. Sikhala Shah was a trailblazing advocate and change maker. Did you know she was also a talented classical violinist and musician? 
1913, while she was living here in Utah, she collaborated with local BYU music professor William Hansen to compose an opera. The Sundance Opera blended traditional native melodies and sacred rituals with a distinctly Western musical style. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Sanai Fuji'i to the stage to perform the song Forsaken from the Sundance Opera. Sanai is currently an opera student at the Brigham Young University School of Music, and she is proud to share her Lakota Sioux heritage with Zikala Shah. Sanai will be accompanied on the piano by Tim McKay. It is now my honor 
to introduce the Honorable Marilyn Lynn Malerba, Treasurer of the United States. Treasurer Malerba is the 18th Chief of the Mohegan Tribe and the first female chief in the tribe's modern history. Prior to becoming chief, she served as chairwoman of the Mohegan Tribal Council and served in tribal government as executive director of Health and Human Services. Chief Malerba is the first Native American to serve as the nation's treasurer. She directly oversees the U.S. Mint, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, Fort Knox, and also leads the Treasury's new Office of Tribal and Native Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Chief Malerba. tonight and I thank you all for the talents that you are bringing to this evening. It is just so very special. Good day everyone and thank you to all our distinguished guests and participants in this celebration. United States Treasurer. I am Chief Lynn Malerba, Chief Many Hearts of the Mohegan Tribe and currently am proudly serving as your United States Treasurer. I'd like to recognize my U.S. Mint colleagues tonight, Jill Weston, Sharon McPike, and Robin Jones, uh, for joining me here because they've worked very hard to make this event such a special event. And so I know there's, they're here somewhere, mostly in the background, uh, but I, I just wanted to recognize them as well. Three days ago, the U.S. Mint released its newest coin into circulation, the Zikala Shah Quarter, as part of the American Women's Quarter Program. This unprecedented circulating coin program is the first to honor trailblazing women, and she truly deserves every bit of that honor. More than 11,000 women from the United States were nominated but only 20 can be selected. And as we learn more about Sakala Shah, you can understand why she is one of them. This program is shining a new light on all their legacies. Zakala Shah, a Yankton Dakota Sioux citizen, is the 15th honoree to be featured on the coin, and its release couldn't have come at a better time. First, the Zakala Shah quarter arrives at a time when our nation celebrates Native American Heritage Month which begins in November. Her quarter builds on the Mint's portfolio of world-class coins and medals, recognizing the important contributions by Native American tribes and individual Native Americans to the history and development of this United States, something that we carry proudly with us, as Cassie so astutely shared her vision with us. In fact, if you looked in your change right now, you could find American Women's Quarters honoring Wilma Mankiller, the first woman elected chief of the Cherokee Nation, and Maria Tall Chief, an Osage tribal citizen, America's first prima ballerina, indigenous or not, she was the first American prima ballerina. History has often overlooked these women. Fortunately, the mint is changing, that by elevating their often untold stories to a national platform, through our circulating coinage. These coins are tangible pieces of art that millions of Americans will encounter every day. In addition to facilitating transactions, these quarters serve as catalysts, sparking conversation and encouraging others to learn more about exemplary women, just like Sikala Shah. The Sikala Shah quarter release is also momentous because it marks one century since the passing of legislation that changed the lives of all of our indigenous people in America. Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 around the same time as Ikala Shah's pivotal advocacy. She was key to the passage of that law. The Mint recognized the Indian Citizenship Act earlier this year through the Native American $1 coin program. Both coins reflect Sakala Shah's lifelong belief that it was possible to be a full U.S. citizen 
while also embracing traditional Native American identities. We can and do walk in both worlds. And what we bring to those worlds are rich in culture, and we enhance everyone's lives by sharing the culture that we share. The coins also honor her steadfast commitment to removing barriers that were standing in the way of remaining and maintaining the unique culture of indigenous people in a time where people were encouraging all indigenous people to assimilate, to forget their cultures. Through her writings, her political activism, and performances, Sikala Shah captivated diverse audiences and promoted traditional indigenous culture in new ways. In fact, she was the first indigenous person, as you heard, in North America to publish an opera called The Sundance, which was based on her essays and helped share her culture through music. And so lovely that you shared that music with us. I really appreciated your performance. Thank you so very much. She accomplished this even though she was forced to change her language, her religion, her culture and traditions at a young age. Like so many Native Americans, Zitkala Shah was renamed, displaced, and even had her braids cut from her head. After she witnessed children undergo similar cruel experiences as a Carlisle Indian school teacher, Zitkala Shah changed the trajectory of her life. She started to question why American Indian boarding schools were necessary at all. Zikala Shah exposed many of the injustices there and helped others to see that no child should be forced to give up what's so uniquely theirs and to be forced to endure the horrors that she had endured herself and generations of indigenous people endured. Her personal experiences, customs, and values were shared nationally through her essays and short stories. Zikala Shah inspired Americans across the country, including another woman writer and 20th century icon, Helen Keller. The Zikala Shah Quarter highlights these triumphs while also recognizing her unique contributions as an author, an activist, and a composer. Zikala Shah preserved her people's culture in the face of institutions that were designed to erase it and eradicate it completely. Her coin will shine as a lasting testament to that legacy, showing all Americans that it is possible to soar above adversities and reach new heights. She will continue to inspire so many young indigenous people and non-indigenous people alike for helping everyone understand what is our history in the United States, and why our cultures are different but should be celebrated. As the nation's first Native American treasurer, I recognize the true significance of this moment and the impact of Zikala Shah. Her quarter reflects a tremendous milestone in the continuous fight to protect Native American resources. Courageous women, women like her led the foundation for me and countless others to follow. The Zikala Shah coin reinforces the nation's commitment to honoring Native American history and heritage. Our commitment at the Treasurer is more than just symbolic. Under Secretary Janet Yellen's leadership, the department has made historic investments and is building on stronger relations with indigenous communities. In fact, Janet Yellen was the first Treasury Secretary to ever visit an indigenous community. She visited the Rosebud Sioux Tribe with me to announce that I would be the first indigenous treasurer in the United States. And she also participated in a round dance that day with the community there. I said, you can do this, I know you can. And she said, I think I can. And she got up and she did the dance uh, with us. And I thought that was really very special. Um, it was a moment for her to be embraced by her indigenous uh, community. As we continue to focus on economic development in Native communities, I'm so excited for the path ahead. I am so honored to have your support in, this, in my journey, in this journey, and grateful for the partnerships that have made this possible. To learn more about um, and to get your own Zikala Shah Porter, please visit the Mint's website at usmint.gov. Um, but you know, I'm very honored to be here tonight 
Mohinge talks about the path of life and the people that we meet on the path. We, are, we have uh, what we call the trail of life, which is a curvy, linear um, depiction of what that trail looks like with the ups and downs, the hills that we encounter, the lows that we encounter, the peaks that we experience. And there's dots all along that trail. It's the people that we meet along that trail. They give us a hand up when we need a hand up, that celebrate for us when we're at the top of the hill, and that tell our stories throughout as we travel from east to west. So tonight I say, uh, many blessings upon you all, many blessings upon these women who mean such a, and remain such an inspiration to all of us. Katapton's Mawish for allowing me to be here tonight. Katapton's Mawish to my indigenous brothers and sisters from Utah who allow me to be on their lands tonight. Thank you. Thanks for the invite, and we're really honored to be here. My whole family was able to come out and 
Yeah, so I told this story earlier, earlier but really it was really surprising. I, I got like a, about two years ago, I got a call on my cell phone, you know, unknown number, usually I don't answer those, but randomly answered it and it was a lawyer from the US Mint, purportedly. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, so, you know, we went through it and, you know, that all went uh, according to plan and we, yeah, so he, he told me kind of about this program that I learned about from him and that my uh, ancestor, who was trying to find the oldest living relative of Zagala so, um, yeah, so it was really, they involved us through the entire process. It was really, really interesting um, being able to just, everything from the inception of the artwork, they brought in a bunch of artists who, I think there were about five different, you know, orders that were potential ones, um, allowed us to help the selection of the actual artwork, who even attended some of the, you know, government committee meetings where they go through the approval process, um, all the way through that, up to the planning of this event and just other things, and that really kept us up to date on everything. It was really a pleasure working, you know, with, with the Mint and really all the other organizations that helped plan this. So. Thank you. And then I think the question that might remain in some folks' this month, although it was answered a little bit in Delmas, why Utah? Why are we here celebrating this quarter on this land? And I'd like to invite Jane to speak to this. Just could you tell us a little bit about how the Kala Shah came to be in Utah? What did that time do for shaping her advocacy going forward? Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here and be part of this program. Um, Sikola Shah was yanked and sued from South Dakota, and she remained true to that throughout her whole life. Um, but when she married Raymond, they were in dire need of employment. And Raymond had gone to Haskell College. Uh, she had graduated from college and had taught at Carlisle, as the film mentioned. Um, but they didn't really have a place in Yankton to work. And so they sought out their uh, friends at the Bureau of Indian Affairs who found positions for them on the Unita Ure Reservation. And so when they first got there, Raymond was a clerk who uh, dispensed tree goods. But in 1906, she took the oath of office and started to teach for the Bureau. And they did various things there. Um, with the youths. But I would have to say this, she hated every minute of it. <laughs> <laughs> she constantly wrote to her uh, Catholic priest and said, please help us find other employment. Please help get us out of Utah. <laughs> no Christians in Utah. <laughs> Please bring a Catholic church out here to send me talk. And uh, none of those please were answered. <coughs> and one of the biggest ironies of that time is uh, that in 1911 she took her son Ohio to a boarding school. In Nauru, Illinois, there was a Catholic boarding school. So even though she criticized and rejected the boarding school system, she uh, Founded a sacred place for her son who didn't fit in with the youths, who didn't fit in with the Presbyterians, and didn't fit in with the other religion, which will be uh, for me and me. <laughs> Thank you for filling us in on that bit of context. I'd like to go through our panels again and ask some more questions to get into their work and, and their involvement here. And Jennifer, if you could tell us a little bit about why it feels important, especially at this moment, to have real women represented on currency, art, statues, you name it. You know, women's history begins in the classroom. And it really starts when a child goes in there and opens a book and does or does not see themselves represented. And there's a quote that we, we um, say a lot at the museum, and it's every time a young girl opens a history book and sees a womanless history, she learns she is worth less. And so our job at the Women's History Museum is to change that narrative because we believe that, yes, if you can see it, you can be it. That's the first step. And the more we have women represented in spaces of knowledge and power, the more we can help close that 95-year 
gender gap. Um, the other thing is, inclusive history is good history. So it's not that these stories haven't existed. It's not that women were not part of the story. It's that their stories were not included. They weren't valued. And so if you look at uh, state social studies standards, we did a report in 2017 that looked at where the women were or were not. It was called Where are the Women. Only 15% of people figured, of, only 15% of those featured in history state social study standards were women. 15%. That is a travesty. So our job is to start really making sure that, that educators have access, but that also really women's history needs to be accessible and available to everyone. Because that's how we're going to start changing this scenario. Agreed. Thank you. And Mark, we'd love to hear more about the stories that you heard about your ancestors. So this woman who has meant a lot to so many people also has that personal connection for you. Could you tell us about any stories you grew up hearing about your great-great-grandmother or what her personal influence has been in your life and that may have changed over time? Yeah, so, you know, of course she, she had passed away long before I was born, um, but, you know, Growing up, my father really kind of instilled in us just our ancestry and how, how much it meant and how much it was very important. Um, and, and I think one thing I'll say, you know, maybe not a story about her, but really just about her impact on our family was uh, my father, who would, he would have loved to have been to, at this event. He passed away in 2016, unfortunately. But um, he would have been so proud to be here. Um, one thing, he, so he was in the U.S. military, he was in the U.S. Navy, um, and he always had to keep his hair really short, of course, you know, for protocol. But um, he always loved, the, you know, and when he was growing up, he loved the fact that, you know, that he had very long hair and sort of curly hair. Um, and when he retired from the Navy, he, he uh, grew his hair long, and he always kind of talked about how it was very important, to, you know, to, um, and I think, uh, you know, she wrote up stories and about you know, going to a boarding school and having cut her hair and things like that. So those are kind of some of the things, you know, maybe one like, small thing about, you know, kind of growing up and understanding, you know, how much it meant to him and how much it meant to her and, and the entire family. So. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Dr. Hagen, we heard a little bit of your, your words about the opera and why that mattered, but could you talk to us about some of the themes that are important, whether the opera or St. Kalish has other writings? What importance do you feel like they have for us today? What should we be learning from what she's saying? I think um, the opera is such a brave act. Uh, and it's really one of the best things to come out of for Utah years. And uh, you can imagine no radio, no media, no telephones. What do you do with your evening hours? And uh, she would get together with her neighbors, which included William Hansen and they would uh, play music for each other. And at one point, they said, let's do an opera. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the Muppets. Let's go to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it was really an audacious act that they would construct this opera. And at first, they talked about doing an opera about Shafita, who was the widow of the chief UA of the unit of UA use. But I think when you look at her writings about Shafita, uh, Gertrude did not have a lot of respect for her and the way she was treated. And so they pulled back and decided to do the Sundance. Um, the Sundance is such a sacred ritual. And most people think about it only associated with men doing their sacrifice. But the Sundance doesn't occur without permission of the women. And one of the things that's really unique about it is that you see this gender balance uh, going throughout the drama of the opera. And you see other structures from the plains, uh, rituals, uh, like you have the the tree over the three gossips. And so the, the trope of gossiping is very important in the opera. It's based on a love triangle 
um, between Ohio, which is the name of her son, and um, this sweet singer. And the evil person is the Shoshone, <laughs> who tries to come and break up the love triangle. Um, and that's, that's one aspect of framing the opera. But what's really interesting is that they involve the community in the performance. And so there are grand pauses, breaks in the opera, where the youths would come out and perform these songs that were traditionally forbidden at this time. They could not practice their religion in a religious context, but they could perform in this opera. And in many ways, it, pervert, it preserved those songs. And uh, so it's, it's a tremendous act of resistance and resilience, which I think characterized her whole life. Thank you for sharing that. And we've got one more question for each of you individually, and then we'll ask Lynn to close it out for everyone together. But um, Jennifer, if you could explain a little bit about how Sig Halashah's quarter and the whole quarter program has fit into efforts to include <coughs> women's stories, make women's stories more visible in US culture and history in the classroom and outside. Yeah, just as I said earlier, you know, um, currency is one of the areas where women have been grossly underrepresented. Um, oftentimes, if you did find a woman on a coin, she was allegorical, whereas if you saw a man on a coin, it was a real man. So when you think about the spaces where women have been underrepresented, um, those are the, the spaces we sometimes take for granted. Sometimes I, I never thought about women on currency, but I certainly did think that women had a place there in, in terms of what I, what I was taught growing up um, from, from not seeing women in these spaces. So the American Women Quarters Program is a great avenue to rectifying that. And really, what we want to do is find all those other avenues as well. Uh, because we want to make sure that women's history is embedded in our culture. And it really is uh, not just in monuments and museums, but particularly the classroom, particularly our history books and our curriculum. How do we get this information out there so that um, really anybody can have it and that will ultimately be in service of a more equitable world. Thank you. And as she's speaking here, I'm thinking about all the great resources we have from the National Women's History Museum and other local organizations and partners here. So please make sure you check out those tables and, and the resources that are available um, to, to bring some of those stories into your own language, classrooms, or educators you may know. Um, thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. Mark, we'd love to come in full circle here a little bit and ask what it is that you would like people to know about your great great grandmother, about your family, about what she fought for. I would say, you know, basically her biggest message is you don't have to apologize for who you are. You know, it's um, you know, there's no reason just because society says something that you have to do something a certain way. Um, and she was unapologetic about a lot of things, and she's kind of went forward with it. And, and a lot of what she did really impacted a lot of people. I mean, just you know, get, going toward getting um, Native Americans the right to vote. I think you know, democracy is something she understood something that democracy is something that you have to allow out everyone to participate in or it's not going to work. It's a concept. It's something that, you know, if you have a certain uh, amount, some certain amount of people in your society that you're not allowing to vote, it's just not going to work. So um, I think that was one of her biggest legacies. Very timely, very important at this moment. Um, Dr. Hayfe, can you close this out by telling how um, the Kalasha and her husband's work affected both Utah and the modern day United States? What's the legacy of their advocacy? Um, not enough is known about her husband, Brayden. We know that he went to law school. We know that he did not become a lawyer. <laughs> we know that Gertrude uh, could at times be a little prickly. And she got into a uh, spat with John Collier, who was the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. 
And he sat down and specifically said that Raymond could not represent tribes under the New Deal in the Roosevelt government. So Raymond had all this legal work prepared for the Land Claims Commission. And he had to find a lawyer to basically purchase his work. And the lawyer that he found was in Washington, D.C. named Ernest L. Wilkinson. Yeah, if you're from Utah, you know that name. <laughs> and so Wilkinson buys the work. Gertrude dies in 1938 without a will. Raymond dies in 1942 without a will. Wilkinson says the first Land Claims Commission suit against the United States in 1949 for $30 million. Anything you read in Utah about tribal councils, about disbursement of funds among the consolidated few tribes are part of Raymond's legacy. And so that's, that's local, but he also, Raymond's work also influenced the Klamath Indians in Oregon and the Northern Pikes in the Valley. And if I may just say that part of that legacy is why my father was hired by the Ute Mountain Utes and why I was raised in the Ute Utes. And uh, I didn't know that when I first started researching Gertrude, but I found all this information in the Denver Archives. So it had a very personal impact on my life. Thank you for sharing that. Um, our time is drawing to a close together, but I would love to ask each of you the same question. And, and it's this, it's one that an audience member submitted, saying that sometimes we might only have a quick moment to tell about his, an historical moment. Um, for example, we're having somebody a quarter. And um, again, that's a very short amount of time to summarize the life work. But if you had a sentence or two, if there's something that you would love for people to share about Six on the Shop, is there maybe sharing a quarter with somebody or telling them about this event tonight? Something that feels important to pass on about her story, about her work. You know, I've, I've been thinking about this question because I knew it was coming. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, one thing that I'm just so inspired by is just her drive to create change. And what has been really special is I see that, that thread in so many of the women in this program. Um, the desire for one, one person to make a world of difference and to step off the sidelines to make a better world. So that is something that I'm really inspired by, by her, and um, we'll definitely share that. Thank you, I love that. Mark? Yeah, just, uh, so for, I guess two things. One, about the quarter itself, so um, you'll see, I guess if you see the quarter, there's a little bird on the top. Um, it's a red bird, a cardinal. Um, so her name means red bird. Um, but just about the college shot herself, uh, I would say, you know, it's imperative on us all to fight for what's right, and I think she taught us that in a lot of ways. Beautifully said, thank you. Dr. Hagen. I don't think I can have much more for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, each of you, for sharing your perspectives and sharing your time here with us tonight. If we could get a round of applause for us. Thank you. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise and insights and 
It is just such a pleasure to be here to learn about her and her life and legacy. And it's also a pleasure tonight to be joined by so many members of the Kalashaw's family and direct descendants. So if you are part of the Bonham family, can you please stand so that we can recognize you? I crept up the stairs as quietly as I could in my squeaky shoes. 
my moccasins had been exchanged for shoes. Along the hall, I passed without knowing whither I was going. Turning aside to an open door, I found a large room with three white beds in it. The windows were covered with dark green curtains, which made the room very dim. Thankful that no one was there, I directed my steps towards the corner farthest from the door. On my hands and knees, I crawled out of the bed and huddled myself in a dark corner. From my hiding place, I peered out, shuddering with fear whenever I heard footsteps nearby. Though in the hall loud voices were calling my name, I, e I knew that even Judevin was searching for me. I did not open my mouth to answer. Then the steps were quickened and the voices became excited. The sounds came nearer and nearer. Women and girls entered the room. I held my breath and watched them open the closet doors and peep behind large trunks. Someone threw up the curtains and the room was filled with sudden light. What caused them to stoop and look under the bed I do not know. I remember being dragged out, though I resisted by kicking and scratching wildly. In spite of myself, I was carried downstairs and tied fast in a chair. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck, and heard them gnaw off one of my thick braids. Then I lost my spirit. Since the day was taken, since the day I was taken from my mother, I had suffered extreme indignities. People had stared at me. I had been tossed about in the air like a wooden puppet. And now my long hair was shingled like a coward's. In my anguish, I moaned for my mother, but no one came to comfort me. Not a soul reasoned quietly, quietly with me as my own mother used to do. For now, I was only one of many little animals driven by a herd. Thank you.
us to the conclusion of tonight's celebration. On behalf of the event host, the U.S. Mint, the National Museum of Women's History, the Utah Historical Society, and Better Days, we appreciate you joining us this evening. We hope that you come away inspired to continue building on Sakala Shah's legacy of leadership, advocacy, and dedication to being a change maker in your own communities. So thank you for joining us today. And if you parked, this is one bit of housekeeping, if you parked in the library's parking lot, you can scan your ticket right outside these doors in the atrium uh, for a two hour validation. So keep that in mind and please drive safely as you go home tonight. And again, thank you so much for joining us tonight.